I'll try to stay on time. I realized maybe I should have tried to claim an hour slot, but I didn't want to um, outstay my welcome on my first time attending the conference. So um, thank you for inviting me. Someone invited me on the Facebook group. Um, I'm Eric Hazen, not to be confused with all the other Erics. Uh, and I work at Boston University, but this is entirely spare time work. So um, this will be quite a contrast to the previous talk, I think, because um, what I have produced is a couple of, I think, one-of-a-kind do-it-yourself HP25 re-implementations. And at this point, I have no plans to mass produce and sell them. So let's see, going on to slide two, just a couple of uh, slides about myself. Um, I've been fascinated by electronics since I was very young and HP products in particular. At age 13, which was in 1973, if you want to age me, I lived in Leeds, England for a while with my family, and my father was an experimental physicist, and I was brought in as an unpaid physics graduate assistant, as they called me, um, to work in the uni. And one of the things I did was to encounter an HP 9100, which I just loved, and I taught myself to program it, and I was immediately hooked on the whole concept of uh, programmable devices. Fast forward a few years, in high school we used HP 2100, running Timeshare Basic. Many of you suffered through that system, although it was pretty capable. We played various games like Trek 73, nice Star Trek simulation, and others. Games such as hacking the system and posting the administrator passwords on the chalkboard were not so legit. Um, my father bought an HP 25 in 1975, and I, I was drooling over it, so I devoted myself to delivering the newspaper faithfully until I could afford my own at about $195 US then. Unfortunately, my HP 25 is dead. It fell in the fish tank with piranhas while I was out of town and my roomies were scared to retrieve it. By the time I got it out, everything was pretty badly corroded. My father's, however, I still have and it's still working. Um, very briefly, I studied computer science and learned a lot of useless things, how to run a Model 29 key punch and how to program Algol and System 370 assembly. I don't think that did me any good in my career, but what really changed my life was getting a TRS-80. Um, I used that to program an assembly language and wrote a fourth system and a multitasking kernel and various other things. And then for a while, I worked at a theater lighting company, ETC, um, and I parlayed my Z80 assembly language experience into doing a lot of low-level software for a couple of their lighting consoles. Since then, the last almost 35 years, I've worked at Boston University developing electronics for the Large Hadron Collider at CERN and have become quite an HP collector. Um, I've acquired a 10C, 11C, 15C, 16C, 67. A couple of them were stolen, but the 11C and the 16C I use almost daily. And I have to say that I never really made the transition to the 41 and uh, more recent um, units. Just double checking, everybody still hear me okay? Yeah, we're good, thanks. Okay, good. Haven't used WebEx before, so just checking. So um, why did I start on this do-it-yourself project? Well, let's see, the HP 25 is my favorite calculator. Um, I, I still have my, my father's, it works well. The display and the keyboard are kind of small for my middle-aged eyes, and I really don't like emulators. Um, I, there's going to be a talk about a, a tactile touchscreen emulator coming up, which I'm really interested in, but I hate clicking on calculator buttons on with a mouse. And I have a bunch of time on my hands. No, not really. But uh. So why use a Z80? Um, I know them inside out. They were released about when the HP 25 came out. Uh, obviously, they couldn't have used one in the HP 25 for cost and power reasons, but at least it was um, it was uh, technology from the same era. And I like designing and assembling good old through-hole um, dip package boards. At work, we deal with parts that are too small to see now, and it's really kind of annoying. And the displays, I'll say a little more about it, but um, I, I really like using old-school display technology. So um, probably could have deleted this slide. There isn't any specification. It's a hobby project. And, but I had goals, big clicky buttons, display I can read, simple hardware I can solder, and cross-development from my Linux machine. So I usually start with the parts in a project. Z80, um, no-brainer. I started with a Z80A, 4 megahertz. Memory, I, I found some UV erasable EEPROMs in my drawer. I thought about using those, but no, nah, I couldn't find the eraser. So I used some more modern parts, some um, EEPROM and a, and a um, static RAM, both 32K by 8 in nice dip packages. 
the display, the first um, first unit I built, I used a 10 millimeter high brightness red um, common anode seven segment displays. They're kind of traditional and easy to program. The driver is a multiplexed um, driver ICM7218, which was the same one I used in theater lighting consoles in the, the uh, around 1980. And amazingly, microchip still produces them and it's easy to use. Switches, there was no question. Cherry MX mechanical switches. I love them on my, my computer keyboards and I just wanted to use them for the calculator. And otherwise I have drawers of LS and S series TTL at work because we never throw anything out. Um, then I started thinking about boards. Uh, how many boards? I did a toy layout in Express PCB, which is a, a free PCB design tool, one of the first ones. I didn't want to do the whole layout in it, but it was a nice way to just mock things up. Um, and it seemed like about 120 by 170 millimeters would be the form factor of the thing. I wanted to fit uh, the Cherry MX key switches into something resembling the HP25 layout, and that worked out pretty well. Um, it didn't look like the CPU would fit on the same board, though, so I started planning for a two-board stack. Um, I don't want to spend too much time showing you schematics, but this is the display and keyboard schematic in KeyCAD, which I love. It required two of these driver chips because each one can handle up to eight digits. So a total of three four-digit 10 millimeter uh, seven segment displays um, and uh, essentially no other parts. That's one reason I like this chip is it, it, it uh, controls the current to the display and the multiplexing and everything is handled uh, in the chip. Um, the keyboard is a pretty straightforward diode switch matrix and the keyboard and the display are driven by um, are connected to the CPU board by two separate ribbon cable connectors. And I did put on, off, and program run switches. The on, off switch is not an on, off switch, really. It just blanks the display. Um, the program run switch does what you would expect. Um, I laid out the board in KiCad. Placement and routing are pretty simple. I, I love JLC PCB, the Chinese manufacturer, and I used pretty conservative design rules that they can handle easily. Um, and I was kind of lazy, so I just used a copper area on the top for ground and a bottom area for VCC, and then I didn't have to route power supply connections uh, explicitly. The CPU is pretty simple, maybe a little over simple um, for a Z80 system. There's the CPU and the EEPROM and the RAM are connected directly to the processor bus. Um, I just want to point out a couple things for people who might DIY their own Z80s. I really like this clock configuration. Um, I'll divide the oscillator by two so the CPU runs at half the oscillator frequency. Use a 74S shot key series flip flop, specifically with a stiff pull up resistor. Provides nice 50% duty cycle clock. Um, rate, weight states were needed because the EE prom is relatively slow, at least the cheap ones. And I wanted to run the CPU pretty fast so that the emulated speed would be about the same as the HP25. There are two I.O. ports. There's an output, 8-bit output port. Um, this chip here, over, and I guess you can't see my cursor, but uh, it doesn't matter. Um, there's one 8-bit output port of which 6 bits are used to drive the columns in the keyboard, 5 bits, sorry, and um, an extra bit for an LED. And then there's an input port that reads back the rows from the keyboard. One really oh debugging thing I just want to point out here is I connect an LED to the halt line on the CPU. I always do that in my Z80 designs, and it means you can tell when you've um, ultimately uh, run into a halt instruction or during early debugging, you can do that deliberately. Um, memory decoding with logic, I.O. decoding with one decoder chip. I think there's not much else to say on here. Oh, one important thing is there is a serial port, but it's bit banged. Probably I'll never do that again. Uh, <laughs> I did get it working, but uh, UARTs are not very expensive. So next time there'll be a UART. Um, the layout, again, pretty straightforward, uh, uh, two-layer board. Um, and yeah, I don't think I'll say any more about that to save time. Um, then bringing it up. So the hardware came back, and that was great. It was easy soldering. It was all through hole. So I put it all together. Um, and then I kind of stared at it and I said, gee, then what? So I didn't have any EEPROM programmer anymore. I haven't done anything like this in a while. So I made this thing you can see on the left hand, lower left part of the picture is an Ar wire wrapped Arduino shield EEPROM programmer. Um, uh, scarily, the first program I programmed into the board, I could uh, type in 
um, in hex from memory, <laughs> it decrements a 16-bit counter to zero and then halts. It takes about 400 milliseconds, if I remember right, on a 4 megahertz Z80. Um, and that actually worked immediately. The halt LED came on after uh, appropriate delay. Um, then I had a struggle getting the BitBang serial port working next time I'll use a UART. And then I took a little diversion that actually took about two months of my spare time to write a nice debugging monitor. Uh, I know there are other Z80 debugging monitors out there. I looked at some of them, didn't really like them anyway. Spare time project. So um, once I had the serial port and the debugging monitor, um, then let's see, I, I started uh, with, of course, Gnome Paré uh, by Eric Smith, who I think is connected. Thank you very much. A wonderful emulator package. The only thing I don't like about it is that I have to click on the screen or try to remember keyboard mappings to use it. Otherwise, it's brilliant. Um, it's pretty complicated now because it supports many different models and even different generations of the HP calculator family. Okay, then I stumbled on this thing by Chris Chung. I have no idea if he's connected or not, called the NP25, the Known Paré Physical. Um, and it's a Woodstock only emulator for the MSP430 uh, microcontroller. And I, there, there are links to all of these things here, but you can see the general idea. Um, I almost built one of those, but again, they're small and they use these tiny LEDs. So in the end, I took some of both. I started with Chris Chung's. And then I ended up actually undoing some of the simplifications that he put in and putting back in original code by Eric Smith. And I got eventually an HP 25 only simulation running in plain C under Linux, just using a, um, the terminal for input and output and double check that the emulator was working correctly. Then I built it using the SDCC cross compiler and the Z88 DK development kit, which is um, very nice and tested it under a Z80 pack. Um, simulator. So I got everything running in simulation. And finally, bringing it up together, uh, there were a bunch of loose ends. Um, for for uh, debugging, I wanted a serial bootloader, so I wrote something that could just um, receive hex files and download them into memory, and then I had to write a C program to send the hex files. And I know there, there are commercial and even open source tools to support a lot of this stuff, but uh, I kind of enjoyed doing it myself. The monitor ended up growing a lot of support, a lot of commands, and I'll probably use it for other things. Um, just pointing out a couple of specific things that were really useful. Um, driving the displays and debugging them, it was very helpful to have monitor commands to do that, a command to scan the HP keyboard. And then once I got the uh, emulator running a bit, I put in some specific debugging features that could um, decode and dump the HP registers, the emulated registers, and that was really helpful. And the debugging was really not subtle things. It was mostly just um, typos and a, and a couple of slightly odd things that happened moving onto the Z80 environment. Um, so finally, I went into a cycle where I was loading and debugging the calculator itself. And um, I guess I had an interim version that emulated the keyboard and display through the serial port um, so that it was very similar to the Unix version, and then uh, hooked up the display on the keyboard and didn't take too long to get it working. Um, and wrapping it up, uh, stacking up the boards, as I said, and adding the on, off, and program run switches for an embarrassingly long time. I had alligator clips there. And then I made what I thought was going to be a, just a very quick temporary wood box, but I don't know. It, it probably will stay in there forever. Um, what next? Well, build another one, of course. I have a home office and an at-work office, and I need two of these things. So I didn't want to just do the same thing again. And um, I have used Nixty tubes for quite a few projects, but they're, uh, they are they need lots of high voltage, and, and uh, they're kind of troublesome. And I'd never used vacuum fluorescent displays before. It turns out they aren't nearly as popular in the retro world as Nixies, and there isn't as much data about them. Um, I was able to use Google Translate on the Russian data sheet and uh, get the basic information and find some examples. And I did a little bit of experimenting. I bought about 20 of these tubes from some guy in the Ukraine, which took a month to get here, but they were packed well. Um, and I played around with them with just some power supplies. Then I launched immediately into laying out yet another board, a vacuum fluorescent display driver board, KiCad again. Um, I, this is probably painful to look at unless you're really an electronics person, but um, I chose this driver chip, the HV5812, which is a um, 
20 output shift register and high voltage um, uh, transistor driver that's actually meant for VFDs. I'm kind of surprised that they're still in production, but they are. Uh, it takes a lot of those to, dis to do 12 digits non-multiplexed, which I wanted to do. I didn't really want to write all the multiplexing um, firmware for the Z80. So the only thing really to mention about these things is they do need some odd power supply voltages. Five volts for the logic. Um, the, the filaments are 1.2 volts with very narrow specified voltage range. So I put an adjustable regulator right here on the board and then deliver 2.5 volts to give a bit of headroom from an external power supply. And then the, um, the, the anodes require 20 volts approximately. I laid out the board in KiCad. This was one of my first adventures in 3D modeling, and I made some kind of crude models for the tubes, and, and it's kind of fun to look at. Um, again, simple two-layer design, uh, a few extra TTL chips, power connector. Uh, OK, then I decided I needed a power supply board, and I bought some boost and buck converters on eBay. Um, they're inexpensive. They're easy to get, but I wanted to be able to turn them on and off because the tubes have a fairly limited life, and I wanted them to um, time out and shut down. And it turns out that some cheap converters do indeed have output enables, but sometimes the output enable causes the uh, output on a boost converter to just drop to the input voltage or something like that, which is not particularly helpful. So I just made a junk box uh, transistor switch circuit using a MOSFET finally to turn the power on and off on the inputs of the boost converters. And then there are enable signals that come from the Z80. Uh, yep, this was a one evening layout, I think. There's the board. Um, putting it all together. So one thing I, I haven't mentioned Arduinos before, I don't think, but I use them a lot for simple debugging and prototyping purposes. So the first thing I did with the display board was to hook an Arduino up to it. And since it's a serial interface, it was only about four wires. And with a little bit of reading of the data sheet messing around, I was able to get that running. And this display of all the hex digits is just a little test program that I wrote um, for the Arduino. And then of course, I'm fast forwarding over quite a bit of work in code integration and so forth. But um, it wasn't that much trouble to make a version of the Z80 assembly code that drove the LED display and convert it for the vacuum fluorescent display and get that all working. Um, yeah, I, I haven't said anything specific about the keys and the labels and so forth. This is a good time to take a slight diversion for that. So these are Cherry MX mechanical key switches. And you can see that the, the layout um, models pretty closely the original HP25 layout. And you can buy on uh, Amazon so-called re-legendable keycaps, which are clear plastic keycaps with a top that snaps off. And so with a bit of experimenting to get the alignment and colors right, I just sort of reproduced the original HP labels and cut, printed them on a color printer and cut them out and put them in the keycaps. And I'm, I'm very happy with the results. Um, they're not going to wear out since they're covered with plastic. And uh, the Cherry MX key switches have a really nice feel, even if it's a little different from the original HP. Um, okay, so in summary, I built two HP25 replicas using Z80 CPUs. They run the original HP25 microcode um, at close to normal speed. Uh, one of them has 10 millimeter LED displays, and the other uses these IV6 vacuum fluorescent displays. I currently have no plans or time to sell kits or finished units, maybe in a few years when I retire. Um, but I've put everything up on GitHub, and you know, I'm happy to respond to a reasonable number of uh, emails and comments um, if people do want to try to build either of these things themselves. I may regret saying that. Uh, I remember if I have anything else here. Backup slides. Um, oh, yeah, this was kind of nice. Um, this just came in last week, but I designed a case for the vacuum fluorescent display one. Um, and I was going to use this as an excuse to buy a laser cutter, but those are pretty expensive and I have lots of other things to do. So I um, fired up LibreCAD, which is a nice, simple, um, open source 2D design tool. And I carefully designed um, all the sides of a box. Uh, as you can see, some of them are transparent acrylic and some of them are plywood. And um, uh, you know, I have trouble getting this kind of thing right, so I did about six versions, but I printed out each one one-to-one -one on paper and 
uh, after I thought things were about right, I glued them on foam core and cut them out with a razor knife and built the whole box up and I found a bunch of mistakes and fixed it. So the amazing thing was I paid 60 bucks, sent it off to Pinoco, took about a month to get them back, but everything fit together. I was, I was pleasantly surprised. There are a few things like holes for power connectors that I forgot. And if you look closely, you notice the program run and on off switches are actually missing at the moment because there isn't any hole for the switches to poke up through this case, but I have a drill press. Um, so yeah, and uh, you know, it's a DIY thing at the moment, the processor reset switch and the USB interface are hanging out the, uh, the front of the box. Um, a uh, couple more things about software. So, um, Programming, programming in HP 25 from the keyboard is no fun. Um, so in the spirit of lots of other more sophisticated things you're hearing about today, I wrote a little assembler in Perl. It reads source code of the format on the left here with just the line number and some ASCII representation of, of the program steps. Um, the assembler produces a listing file as output that lists the step number and the display format. And then it produces a hex file, which is just the raw the raw representation that's stored in the calculator. I love command lines. So then there's a C program that loads a program into the calculator over uh, USB, just like that. So I can keep a library of programs and load them whenever I want. Um, uh, Emacs integration. So I'm also a dedicated Emacs uh, editor user. And so I'm implementing cut and paste back and forth from the calculator into Emacs. So you can run a calculation, you push the F1 key on your keyboard if you're in Emacs, and that puts the X register into a um, cut and paste buffer. And this is implemented as a mixture of C++ and a little bit of Emacs list to uh, bind to the keyboard. Um, and you can specify an argument in Emacs to, to, to pick which register of the stack you want and, um, and uh, read uh, storage registers and so forth. I think that might be it. Yeah, this is my last slide. So um, just a few other comments. The original C version, it, admittedly, this is C code that was written um, probably mostly by Eric Smith to run on a workstation. And so it, it was probably a testimony to the quality of the SDCC compiler and library that it ran reasonably at all on an 8-bit C80. I didn't do a lot of optimization, um, but it ran at maybe 20 to 25% of the HP 25 speed originally. And so I launched with great enthusiasm into rewriting Eric Smith's entire emulator in Z80 assembly language. And someday I may live long enough to finish that, but boy, it would be a lot of work. I don't know if anyone has done anything similar or not, but um, then I noticed that you can buy off the shelf CMOS Z80s that are rated up to 20 megahertz. Um, and so I ended up running the Z80 at 16 megahertz, uh, and that results in an emulated speed that's within, I don't know, 10 or 15% at the original HP 25. So I'm happy for now. It seems a little bit untidy to overclock the CPU like that, but it's within specs, things work. Um, what next? I don't know. I uh, have a little more work to do on the Emacs integration. Um, I really like to consider upgrading the thing to an HP 29C, which is the most capable calculator in exactly this physical package. And so I wouldn't have to do anything other than relabel my keycaps. It would be nice to have um, twice as many program steps. Um, and who knows, maybe someday I'll build a third version with Nixie tubes, which would be cool, but troublesome. Um, I think that's it. Yes, that's it. I've done my best to get it back on time or at least not farther behind brilliant thank you very much eric that was incredibly interesting there's been lots of chat about that um i'm intrigued about the piranhas um, <laughs> um there are all questions as to whether the piranhas survived but um the, the piranhas um so they they lived for almost 10 years after i finished uni my parents inherited them they hated it but they fed them goldfish and uh, yeah. <laughs> Fabulous. Uh, any, anybody got any questions? You can unmute yourself to ask questions. How did you create the double wide enter key? Um, it's just an ordinary switch, but you can buy uh, double wide or mm -hmm. even um, two by two size keycaps in, in minimum quantity of five. Cool. 
I think I, uh, also put some extra hardware in there, but I didn't bother with that, and it works fine. The uh, Zurich, yeah. Zurich Smith, um, I think you've done a wonderful job on that. I'm always, I, I, I'm always uh, intrigued by seeing people, uh, you know, take advantage of the of the, of the code uh, that I wrote and do, you know, extend on it and do do neat stuff with it. Uh, I'll make one comment about your Z80 at 16 megahertz. I haven't done a timing analysis on that. Technically, the 20 megahertz Z80 to run it at 20 megahertz actually needs memory with a negative access time. So at 16 megahertz, my guess is you're probably right on the edge of that. But if it works, I can't argue with that. Um, I, according to my arithmetic, which um, I, I did moderately carefully, at 16 megahertz, you need something like 70, 65, or 70 nanosecond access time memory, which is exactly the speed rating by coincidence of the static RAM I have. Um, I did, as I mentioned quickly, I did put in two wait states to access the EEPROM, and the code copies itself from EEPROM to RAM before it starts running. But yeah, I agree. The 20 megahertz C80 is kind of a, a fictitious thing. <laughs> And I'd love to rewrite the code in assembly. I think that would be a wonderful thing to do, but I may have to retire first. Well, um, if, if, if you want to discuss offline, I have some ideas of how, you, how the speed of the C code can actually be improved without without doing a total assembly rewrite. Uh, I, I can certainly appreciate the, uh, the idea of, of rewriting an assembly. I've, you know, I've written uh, the equivalent code in assembly for a microchip PIC processor. I don't really recommend that exercise in general, though, for, for exactly the reason you're talking about. You can spend an awful lot of time on it. Yeah. I'm sorry, this is Bob. I can't tell who it is who's talking, or is that Eric still? It's Eric. That was Eric. Oh, okay, good. Good, good, good. Yes, yes. All right. No, then I, I can probably find you. So, yeah, it would be interesting to have a little chat about optimizing the C. You know, I looked at it a bit, but um, at some point I really just wanted to get the thing working. And I was so close that I just forged ahead and cranked up the clock speed. Yeah, the the um, one of the hot spots in it is is doing the, uh, you know, the nibble at a time uh, register operations. And, and I have some Kind of experimental code, not fully validated. That that unroll. Well, I was going to use the word unroll. That's not quite correct. But any anyhow, um, I, although now that I think about it, actually it probably won't help on an eight bit processor. So so, but we can talk about it. Yeah. Good. Hey hey Eric, um, you and I are about the same age, and when you started talking, I realized we have some parallels. While while you were delivering papers, I was mowing lawns to buy my HP twenty five. <laughs> and on my HP 2000 timeshare basic system, I wrote a uh, text editor, assembler, and emulator for the 25 so I could use alphanumeric labels. That's brilliant. Yeah, I, 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 I didn't it. actually think of that. I mean, I, I had access to both at the same time, but I never put two and two together. I did dream yeah. very briefly about something with a solenoid to push each key and a card reader, which... Never built, of course, but. <laughs> well, you've, you've taken this far beyond my wildest dreams, so you, you've done a fabulous job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. That, that was great.